Um, oddly enough, this is the 23rd day of the month in 2023, and we're in Matthew 23. We've been working our way through Matthew. And uh, uh, one of the ways that you get people to, uh, one of the ways people who have YouTube channels to get more views is to say things like, watch this person school this person, or trash this person, or destroy this person. That seems to attract views. I don't know what it is about human nature, but we just like to see somebody chopped down. Maybe we think they deserve it. And we're going to look at a passage of scripture where if you were making a YouTube channel title, you would probably say, watch the Pharisees get destroyed by Jesus. But of course, that's not what's actually happening here. It's very easy for us to impose an angry tone that actually doesn't exist in the text. And yet because of how our culture tends to think and the way human nature tends to respond, we can come across these kinds of ideas. Jesus is actually concerned about the future church. He's got very few days left that he's going to be with his disciples. He knows he's going to be arrested, he's going to be tried, he's going to be crucified. He knows all those things are going to happen. And he also knows that if human nature prevails in the leadership of this church that he is forming, that pride will rise and it will actually create distance between the people that are called to lead and the people they are called to reach. And this happens in every, every human endeavor. It, it starts very early in our lives. So when, in elementary school, if we want to be someone's friend and they don't like someone, we won't like that person. And so, and, it, and I wish I could tell you we outgrow it, but the truth is, is that we keep finding ways to distance ourselves from other people in order for some kind of perceived benefit. So we're going to look in chapter 23 of Matthew, and it says, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples. So he's talking not to the Pharisees. He's talking to the crowds and to his disciples and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries, I'll tell you what that is if you don't know in just a minute, wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats at the synagogue. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven, nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Uh, one of the things that people like to do is if you want to discredit a message or a group, you just find the weakest member of that group and something that's wrong with them or something that is obviously out of bounds, and you call everyone's attention to it. That game gets played all of the time. Just find the poorest example and then try to paint everybody in that group like that person. And thanks to artificial intelligence, social media, Google, just about anything anyone has ever said or done is available and researchable, and you can find, you have to ignore a lot of good stuff that people did, but if you can find that one thing, why, you can basically neutralize them and discredit them for the rest of their lives. We can ignore a lot of the good that they have done. What we wind up doing is labeling people for life, and labeling people for life is not a way to help them, it's a way to avoid them. If you've been labeled, you know what that feels like. And this labeling can actually make us apprehensive because we're, we don't know enough about a person to get close to them. And it can also make us self-righteous because we can look down on others because of something we know about them. Uh, we have, in our culture, I think, given up on knowing people and settled for knowing about people. And it's not good for us. 
It's not very fulfilling, it's not very satisfying, and it's not very healthy. So because of this, we actually wind up letting other people pick our friends for us. And we let other people decide what we're willing to support or engage in. And as I mentioned a minute ago, this behavior starts very early, all the way down to elementary school. And Jesus knows that this is actually a life-limiting thing. Because what happens is, is it teaches people to be susceptible to peer pressure. I wish I could tell you that was only a thing that we faced in middle school and high school. But every single one of us in this room have to battle against the ideas of peer pressure in our lives. Now, Pharisees were people who took following God very seriously. In fact, some translations even use the word the serious for Pharisees, because they were, they read, they memorized every rule in the first five books, the, not just the Ten Commandments. If you take the first five books of the Old Testament, there's 613 commandments. There's 248 do's and 365 don'ts, and they tried to not only memorize them, but incorporate them into their everyday life. They took it very seriously. And you could ask yourself, what could be wrong with that? What's wrong with taking God's word seriously? What's wrong with trying to live according to the commands that God has given? There is as much danger in our accomplishments as there is in our failures. When it comes to our spiritual life, there's as much danger in our accomplishments. Something can happen when we believe we are getting the faith thing right. And what can happen is we begin to see other people differently. We begin, by the way, when we start getting some things right and people notice it, those things that aren't so right in our life, we have to hide them. And, and what, in order to distract people, sometimes we have to call attention to the things that we are getting right. Jesus saw this behavior, but what he understands is he also saw motives. And this is really important. You and I don't see motives. We see behavior, and then we assume motives. We use our imagination to come up with a reason why someone might have done something. God actually does not give us the power or the ability to know what someone's motive is, and that's a really good thing, because if we actually knew people's motives, we would have a hard time staying connected with them. We would have a hard time being patient with them. We would have a hard time forgiving them. We would have a hard time loving them. Jesus actually knows our motives. He's going to talk about some of the motives here. He actually knows what the motives are, but the good news is, is that he still loves us and he is still patient with us. How many are glad even though God knows our motives, he still loves us, yes? Yes, that's good news. He knows, why? Because he knows we can grow. He knows that we can change. He knows that grace can transform a person's life. And so Jesus was concerned that the perception of spiritual success was going to be all that people focused on, and they'd wind up living a lesser life. So the teachers of the law, he said, are teaching scripture. That's a good thing, right? The problem, hear this, the problem is not God's word. The problem is not that God's word is outdated. The problem, it is always easier to say something than it is to do something. It is always easier to say something than it is to do something. And in their impatience, they keep adding more burdens on people's lives. These very serious religious people. And when the person cannot take it anymore, they don't help them. What they do is they declare that person to be unworthy and uncommitted. They'll tell you what to do, but they won't help you do it. They have no mercy. They just cut you off. On those who are struggling, they offer no help. Please hear this. The church is always at its best when it proclaims the truth and helps people live it. See, the answer to our culture right now, there are lots of people who think that the church should back away from truth, that God has not called us to do that. But he's also called us not to be like the Pharisees, which is just to keep piling on truth, but not help people live it. And when people fail, just to distance ourselves from them. 
People have always desired honor. We want to be respected. We want to be appreciated. We want to be acknowledged. And in the ancient world, the way that would happen is you would make a claim about yourself and then other people would recognize that and you would have honor. There was another very powerful force in the ancient world and it's still at use today. And that is the power of dishonor or the power of shame. The threat of dishonor was intended to keep people from doing things that were not healthy or not good. Uh, things, it, shame was intended to be a deterrent. And people still try that to this day. Here's the problem. I've never met a single person who improved for the better because of shame. That's not how it works. Once, see, well, what is shame? So guilt is I did something that's wrong. And in case you think that no one should ever feel any guilt, really? Do you want someone who lies to you to not feel some guilt about that? Do you want someone who takes something from you to not feel some guilt about that? Guilt says I did something wrong. That's how we know we're out of bounds. Shame says I'm a bad person. That's a big problem because once you believe you're a bad person, all the options you have in front of you are not good for you or for anybody else. Shame is not something God intended to be a tool of the church. So. The only way to gain honor is to get people to notice something good that you have done. And if you do something dishonorable, the only options available to you are to hide and to deny it. But when you look at the Christian faith, things like confession and forgiveness are real important parts of it. And so if we use the whole shame model, we wind up not being able to exercise the very things we need, not only to experience a restored relationship, but to be able to be restored to what God intended for us to be as human beings. So the word was phylacrities. If you don't know what that is, these were little leather boxes and they would put them sometimes on straps on their arms or across their forehead. And inside these little leather boxes, there would be passages of scripture. They, they were commands and, and they were very easily seen. They were supposed to put these on when they were praying. So, so like when we would stand to pray, everybody would just take it and, and put on their phylacrities. And, and the idea was, is I'm reminding myself that there are commands in Scripture, and I should pay attention to them. And, but here's the challenge. They started making them bigger. Why, why would you make your phylacrities bigger? Everybody say phylacrities. <laughs> it's a funny sounding word, isn't it? And, and, then, and then they had tassels. If you don't know about this, you can find this in, in uh, Numbers. Uh, I think it's the 15th chapter. The, the idea is that tassels would be put on the four corners of a garment in order to remind a person about the commands of God and to pray. And so what the, the Pharisees, the Syrians started doing is they kept making their phylacrities bigger. I mean, pretty soon it's taking up the whole forehead and, and around their arm and it's, it's, it's all the way down their arm and they, and they made their tassels so long that it's just dragging. Like you could trip over those things. Uh, Make them longer. We cannot call attention to ourselves and to God at the same time. That's the problem. And they're calling, like maybe they thought, if my phylacrities are so big, no one can ignore them, maybe they'll be inspired to remember the commands of God. But the purpose of the prayer tassels and the purpose of the phylacrities were to engage in a conversation with God, to remind yourself to pray, to ask God for help, not only for yourself, but for other people. And now they're doing something else. Did you see the size of the phylacrities on that person? They must be <laughs> spiritual. The prayer tassels are supposed to remind people to pray. And all they did was make them longer. There's a difference between letting our light shine and shining a light on ourselves. There's a difference between a searchlight and a spotlight. They're both lights, but they have very different purposes. We cannot demand attention for ourselves and give attention to others. If we're wanting everybody to notice us, there's a lot we're going to miss in life. He says this, they love the place uh, uh, of honor at banquets. 
and the most important seat of the first seat in the synagogues. They just love that place of honor. It's not enough for them that they were invited. It's not enough that they're participating in the banquet. They have to be a more important person in the room. And if someone doesn't do that, if they sit someone else in the, that chair, then they're frustrated. They can become angry and annoyed. And they forget, you actually were invited to this event, but that was not enough. They get feelings of rejection. They feel like they've done something in their life that earns them that honor. And to reject that, they can tell themselves, is even rejecting God. Like these people don't recognize spiritual honor when they see it. They're spiritually blind. And now because someone's not honoring me, I make assumptions about them and God. Do you, do you see the problems? This is why Jesus wants to address this with his disciples. And so they love the important seats in the synagogue. Uh, by the way, this was, this was not only where the chair was placed, but it was a chair made differently so that everyone knew, oh, that's the chair. It's, by the way, this is a common practice even in lots of churches today, and I'm not throwing any stones. But in lots of churches today, you, you'll come in and there'll be a big chair, and that's where on, up on the, on the platform of the stage, that's where the pastor sits. And, the, and then there'll be a, a lesser chair, and that's where the uh, assistant pastor sits. And, and they have a row. If you get all the way down to the end, there's a little stool where the youth pastor sits. <laughs> and kind of like that. So, what, what is that doing? It's, 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 it's communicating some kind of, of hierarchy. And, uh, and, and Jesus said, that's, that's not going to help the church accomplish its mission. That's going to disconnect people from the church. And it's something that we need to think about. They love to be greeted in the marketplace. And by the way, greeted doesn't just mean saying hi. Like in our neighborhood, maybe it's the same way in your neighborhood, anybody coming down the street, anybody going up the street, anybody walking, anybody on a bike, anybody. If you're a human being, we wave. Does anybody else do that? Yeah. Could be a burglar come in to steal. I don't know. You know, taking Amazon packages off the front porch. But I, we're friendly. We wave at all of them. We just, good morning. You know. Um, we wave. It, it's not about just saying hi. In the ancient world, they had a practice, and the practice was that the more important a person was, the longer your greeting was. And so you might refer to some titles or some accomplishment, and, and you might even bow. And, and, all, and, and if they were really important, that greeting would be longer. And, and, and what does that mean if you're poor and you're powerless? You get ignored altogether. Do you see what Jesus is after here? You're spending all your time with very long greetings with people that you perceive to be honorable, and yet the poor and the powerless are all around you, and you have nothing to say to them. You don't even notice them. And in Jesus' church, this would be a huge problem. Those are the people he's called to reach. That's why we're here. The length of greeting, it became a problem. And he says they love to be called rabbi, which is more than just teacher. We assume, we assume that the word only means teacher. It's really, the word is, is interpreted master teacher, the best teacher, the expert teacher. Don't, we just love that. Their heart craves some kind of recognition. They want to be seen as an expert in something. In something. Um, I think it's true. I think I know more about my wife than any other living person. And she certainly knows more about me than any other living person. But sometimes we equate knowledge to love. And we get lots of knowledge about people. And we think that's the same as a relationship. And it's not. And the Pharisees had lots of knowledge about God. No relationship. And he says, do not call anyone father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Obviously, is not, Jesus is not saying that children should not call their father father or dad. That's, that's not the point. 
You know, my, my kids came to me one time and they said, uh, we want to call you by your first name. I said, I said, why is that? And they said, well, we just, we want to call you by your first name. I said, well, you can. I said, but there's only two people in the whole world that can call me dad. So they decided to call me dad. Uh, the Apostle Paul talked about this uh, in 1 Corinthians 4. He said, I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you my, as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians or instructors in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Paul helped bring them into the faith. They, they were born into the faith as a result of his ministry, and they just naturally called him father. But there were other people who wanted to be called that, even though they hadn't done anything like that. Why? Because they liked the sound. They liked the sound of the title. It's easy. Now, by the way, so there are some people who say, well, then we shouldn't be using any titles. So no father, no rabbi, no teacher, no nothing. It's just as easy to become self-righteous about not using titles <laughs> as it is about using, no, no, don't, do not call me that. And so what are, what are we doing? We're calling attention to ourselves, but the problem is not calling someone what they are. The problem is wanting to be called something we are not. That's the problem. That's the problem. Being important is not the same thing as making a difference. And our culture and our nature keeps wanting to be important. And Jesus understood if we run that game, no one is going to be changed and the church will be stifled in its mission. Jesus insisted that the path to greatness was actually through serving he said that if we elevate ourselves, we'll humiliate ourselves. It's not a good game to play. It, it, it's, it's more than just a desire to be accepted or to be loved. It's a desire to want to be revered. It's a desire to want to be recognized. The, those who humble themselves will be exalted. The, the, goal, the goal is not to be over someone or above someone, the goal, the reason for humility, the reason is to be with someone. Did Jesus walk around saying, keep your distance, son of God passing here, make way. Everybody, listen to this, everybody wanted to be near Jesus. People who didn't think they had any relationship with God or any desire to have one wanted to be around him. Why is that? Because he didn't distance himself from them. He didn't lord anything over them. He just wanted to be with them. When the church is willing to be with people in our world, that's when we will make the difference. And as long as we think that we are above or better, we'll have no influence for the good. So Jesus says, humble yourselves. Now the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were actually not living for God. They were using God. They had combined gracelessness with greatism and created a religion out of it. Jesus actually practiced what he preached. I'm going to have the worship team come up. This is what we know from Matthew, the 11th chapter. What did he say? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Or in Mark chapter 10, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or John chapter 5, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son does also. It wasn't all about him. I'm just sharing the words that I've heard my father speak. I'm doing the things that he has shown me. 
Mark chapter 10, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? He's humbling himself. Matthew chapter eight, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man who had leprosy. He said, I am willing, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. And then Jesus told him, do you think he's trying to get attention here for something good he'd done? Jesus told him, see that you don't tell anyone. Go show yourself to the priest. Offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Or Philippians 2, in your relationships with one another, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. He humbled himself. God exalted him. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What did this enable Jesus to do? Jesus lived a life with a kind of freedom that was stunning. He wasn't trying to prove himself. He wasn't trying to connect with the powerful. He wasn't trying to up his status. He just lived out the grace that he knew everyone needed in their life, and he knew that God offered. And that is such a freeing thing. You would be surprised. You would be surprised how much of a difference it makes in your life when you stop trying to prove yourself to other people, and you just are with other people. I think this quote comes from a journalist who was a drug addict. So you won't find it in the Bible in case you go looking. The only currency left in this bankrupt culture of ours is what we share with each other when we're not trying to prove something to each other. This is what the church has to share, and this is what makes the difference. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, you have come to help us live a life that is free, but we can't do it if we keep playing the same game all the time, trying to be recognized, trying to be better than someone, trying to keep our distance from someone that could hinder our reputation. Would you help us this morning live the freedom that your son lived so that the church and we can be all that you intended for us? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.